Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure. I am a little bit intimidated to talk in front of uh, uh, such an expert crowd of people. And uh, actually, I also met uh, two, years, two, two weeks ago uh, Garrett at the AVS meeting in Portland. I discovered a good number of people were listening to my talk in uh, Portland. So I decided to change slightly or partly the talk to introduce a part uh, which is new, which is actually old. So I'm going to go through uh, the way I came to uh, work on single atom catalysis, which is a very long way, which is basically go through, uh, let's say, my uh, personal uh, history in science, which I think sometimes is good to see how things develop. And uh, uh, maybe we have something to learn from that. So I started a long time ago, more than four decades ago. And when we started, uh, this guy, Professor Renato Hugo, who was, uh, uh, who was essentially my boss at the time, he gave me the task and uh, to study lithium clusters and the interaction of lithium clusters with hydrogen molecules. That was a very challenging topic at the time. Nobody had done something like that. And we were using, believe it or not, artifact calculations to study these kind of systems. And what you see here is a potential energy surface which was constructed by points, by calculation, calculating hundreds of points where the molecule basically arrives from the, from the gas phase, it goes to a subtle point and dissociate on these clusters. Well, all this work uh, was done on computers, but on a time when I started my thesis, so 40 years ago, we were more or less here. And uh, so the uh, computer time has increased uh, six, seven, maybe eight times, uh, uh, and it's in uh, order of magnitudes, which is remarkable. And uh, of course, we will see the effect of this. When I started my thesis, again, more than 40 years ago, we were still using cards, punch cards. And uh, of course, uh, people are laughing today, but that was the way we are doing. So every calculation, you have to go to a machine and read the punch cards and then come back and wait for the result. That was a completely different way of doing science. Of course, the lithium cluster were very um, useful to me so because- When was this? 1980, 1981, 1979, something like that. So uh, the lithium cluster were good for me because I got in touch with this person, Professor Jaroslav Kutecki. He was uh, at the time in Berlin. So Professor Jaroslav Kutecki invited me uh, to go to Berlin to work on lithium clusters. But there, uh, they were using multi-reference CI. So we were using a uh, uh, an approach which goes beyond our report. And I did my thesis working on pseudo potential. So we, I combined a code of pseudo potential calculations with multi reference CI. And so we were able to do calculation on also on heavy atoms with uh, this kind of code and study also electron excited states. At that time, Berlin was divided in two parts. Many young people forgot this, but this is, was the time where basically the war was divided in two. When I was there, at the Free University, I was I got this kind of reprint request cards. You have may, have may have heard this. There was no internet at the time, so people were sending small cards asking for a reprint of your paper, and you got three of these requests coming from the uh, Academy of Wies the Wissenschaft and der DDR, so from the East Berlin part. And so I answered with a letter and I got in touch with these people. The story is long, but I'm not going to tell you now because otherwise it would be too long. And I started to basically visit regularly these people at the east, in the east part of Berlin. And the guy who wrote me the card was Helmut Haberland, who was a scientist there, and I met Angela Merkel and other people. And we started a collaboration in a time where things were completely different from now. But I started working with them and we published a couple of, couple of papers with this guy, Joachim Sauer. And this was my first contact with single atom chemistry because we are studying a nickel atom interacting with a water molecule. And we studied basically the act of, effect of intermolecular forces or in configuration interaction to include electron correlation. Well, these papers are not very relevant scientifically, 
but they were re very relevant from a point of view of human relationships. We can say that was open science ante litterum because we were crossing the borders in a world which was completely divided. Well, in the time we were, as I said, we were studying excited states of molecules and clusters, and we were we got in touch with another interesting person, uh, Wolfgang Kretschmer. Kretschmer was a, a chemist. Uh, he was studying the uh, spectra of carbon aggregates in the um, comets or in interstellar space, and he was doing Raman and, and, and other spectroscopies, and he wanted to know about the excited state. So we got, we did this calculation of excited states of carbon molecules. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is that in those years, we are in the middle of 80s, uh, Smalley, Richard Smalley, he started to produce clusters with a machine which was basically producing a supersonic jet of uh, uh, gas phase atoms. They were aggregating and he was studying the abundance of these objects. And with this method, he discovered the famous C60, the fullerene, which was discovered in 1985. But the reason I'm, I'm mentioning this is that no, probably Smalley would have never got the Nobel Prize without Kretschmer, the Kretschmer is the guy that we met in Berlin, because in 1990, Kretschmer and Hoffman, they published a couple of papers where they showed that uh, C60, it only also exists under different conditions because the apparatus of Smalley was producing tiny amounts of clusters, while with these methods, with art voltaic, and it was possible to produce relatively large amounts of C60. And that was the way of to the Nobel Prize. But you see that in the Nobel, when the Nobel Prize Committee in 1996, they wanted to award a Nobel Prize, there was no question that it was to go uh, to go to Kroto and Smalley. And uh, Kreisler and Uffman were the two guys that basically went from, let's say, a very specific experimental apparatus to the possibility to produce uh, interesting quantities of a material, but four people is too much. Nobel Prize can only go to three people, and that's why they didn't got the Nobel Prize. The Nobel Prize went to Kerr, and this story was told me by members of the Nobel Committee, so I think it is true. Well, after that uh, time in uh, in Berlin, I moved to IBM Almaden in the in the eighties, working with Paul Begos. And uh, Paul Begos introduced me to the idea and uh, took a concept of using clusters to model surfaces. So we were using, and today it may look ridiculous, we were using uh, four, ten uh, silver atoms to represent a, a metal surface. And we were doing R34 calculations. And you may think this is completely uh, crazy. It's partly crazy, but believe me, the numbers that were in those papers are incorrect. But the physics was properly described. And the papers that we published with Pegos in those years are plenty of uh, physical insight. So there was an attempt to understand the mechanism behind given phenomena, or for instance, behind the core level binding energy shifts. So we are using cluster models to represent solids, which of course is something where we had also a number of troubles to solve, but that was an interesting thing. In those years at IBM, I also was, uh, I was there in 1987 when there was the announcement of a Nobel Prize to Bernard and Müller, two IBM researchers. But I was in Almaden, California. They were in, I, at IBM Zurich, and they got the Nobel Prize for the superconductivity, which was opening the door to this uh, oxides or cuprates, which is a new field. And we also get involved in the study of, um, in this case, the famous IBCO, so this oxide. So we started to use cluster models to describe oxides, and the relevance of this will become clear in a moment. When I, I went back to Milano, in Milano, there was a group of synthetic chemists doing clusters from a different point of view, where we're synthesizing clusters with ligands beautiful molecules of very, very nuclearity. We could go up to 40, 50 atoms, very well defined. Those, the structure was completely well known. And of course, for somebody who studied cluster, you want to know how the properties evolve. 
as a function of the number of uh, metal atoms in your cluster. And so we wanted to study that, but of course we were very limited in terms of computer resources. So at that time we were using semi-empirical approaches. So we were parameterizing uh, integrals, the famous intermediate neglect differential overlap in the method to study nickel clusters and with carbon ligands. And for instance, we found that the ligands, the CO ligands, uh, are not innocent. They change the electronic structure of the nickel atoms. They quench the magnetic moment of the nickel particles. So if you completely surround a cluster by ligands, you may completely kill the magnetization of the cluster. But of course, we are, these were semi-empirical calculations. We wanted to go beyond that. And so I got in touch with uh, a guy, not Rösch, in Munich, because he was starting working with, or he was working since some time, with low density functional theory. At that time, you have to realize that very few people were working with DFT. It was just starting. And uh, with Notker, we addressed the same problem, clusters with ligands, and we were able to compute relatively big objects, also thanks to the fact that the code that they, they developed had a, um, could exploit symmetry. So this is a nickel 44 cluster with 48 CO ligands, it was the largest system that we one could that was computed at that time. And of course, we confirm that in fact these ligand shells change the properties of a metal particle. The metallic atoms remains inside the particle. The atoms which are and at the surface of the particle are strongly perturbed by the ligands. Well. Of course, the, the main goal uh, and the main dream at the time was to be able to simulate catalysts. And catalysts, we know, are complex systems composed of metal particles on an oxide surface. And, okay, and again, I mean, the first thing that to model is the oxide support. And when I was in Milan, I started to use cluster models to, to basically uh, represent oxides. And they started from the simplest system, which is an ionic oxide, like magnesium oxide. And the reason was, again, that I didn't have enough computer time. So we, I said, this system can be represented by point charges to a large extent because they are ionic. And so we started looking at this system with very rudimental uh, models. We started to look also at defects at oxides using larger clusters, like, for instance, oxygen vacancies. And this was instrumental to make a further step, which was in uh, the, uh, uh, first of all, to be able to compute for the first time, and we are in the middle of the 90s, so this first calculation where we put real clusters, four atoms of nickel, four atoms of copper, on the surface of magnesium oxide and computing the density of states or the properties of adsorbed CO molecules. All this was quite useful because to war, more or less in both years, this guy, Uli Eitz, he developed a very fascinating technique to study clusters on surfaces. He used the same apparatus that Smalley has created, as, as invented to generate uh, mass selected clusters. The clusters were ionized and then deflected and selected by mass and deposited with a soft landing technique on a specific support, in this case, magnesium oxide. And so since we were working on magnesium oxide, and uh, uh, Uli Eyes contacted us to study and interpret their experiments. And this is another very interesting piece of work where we get in touch with single atoms. Because let me explain this experiment uh, where Uli Eyes generated beams of PD atoms, dimers, trimers, pentamers, up to PD30, and he deposit them on an MGO surface. And then they exposed these systems to acetylene, and acetylene can react to form benzene. Three acetylene molecules can form a benzene ring. But you, know, you see, the MGO surface is totally inactive. But if you deposit one PD atom, you start to see this peak in this, which is a temperature for gram desorption spectrum. So you start to form benzene with just one atom of palladium supported on MGO. And then if you have clusters, you can produce benzene at different temperatures, depending on the size of the cluster. 
But the interesting aspect that in the calculation we did, we demonstrated that the PD atom is active only if it sits on specific vacancies, defects, which provide excess electrons to the PD atom. So this was also showing the importance of defects. So this paper, which is uh, the title says one atom is enough, now is cited as one of the first example of single atom catalysis. But of course, we didn't know and it was a different name. Uli Eitz, to do these experiments, he was depositing NGO tin films. And this field of the tin films has become a very popular field in the, in the 90s and, the two, and, and, and the, uh, after the turn of the century. Because, of course, if you use a tin oxide layer, you may use spectroscopies like uh, XPS or photo emission. You can, use, you can use STM to be basically identify your species on the surface because these are conductive. You know, we have a conductive support. And this brought me in contact with another important person in my life, which is Joachim Ayo uh, Freund, Hans Joachim Freund, and at the Fritz Haber Institute. And we had a lot of uh, exchange together. And when I, when I was there, also got, uh, got the Nobel Prize. So it's uh, sometimes I brought some luck to the places where I have been. <laughs> and, uh, and we'll see if there are more examples of this. And uh, well, here uh, I had another, uh, another story which is related to atoms on, on surfaces. Because if you take a gold atom and you put, on, uh, put it on a magnesium oxide surface, there is nothing special happening. The gold atom remains uh, atomic like. It keeps one unpaired electron in the 6s orbital. This is a majority spin, and this is an atomic minority spin. This is a 6s orbital. The alpha component is full, the beta component is empty. APR tells you there is one unpaired electron on gold, nothing really special. Well, but since we were interested in tin films, one day I gave to one of my students a topic and I told him, look, I'm going to give you a very boring uh, subject. You have to compute a gold atom or a palladium atom on an MGO film and on the same MGO film supported on a metal like molybdenum. Nothing, we don't, don't expect nothing spectacular, but just we want to see what is the effect of a metal under the oxide film. And the student, First of all, he computed palladium, and in fact, palladium was exactly the same on the bare MGO surface or on MGO surface supported on, on molybdenum. But and then you look at gold, and gold you see one, two, three, four layers of magnesium oxide. The results are completely converged. This is a binding energy when the gold sits on an oxygen atom, and of course, the binding energy when the gold sits on magnesium is alpha, so it's much smaller. Nothing really surprising. But when he did the same calculations on, if, on, on MGO layers supported on molybdenum, he came with these results. And the results were shocking because, first of all, you notice that the binding energy of a gold atom on magnesium is much larger than the, the binding energy of, of a gold atom on oxygen. And then, even after five layers, the results are not conversed. So it's a completely different situation. And of course, when somebody comes to you, at least in theory, there are only two possibilities. Either is a discovery or there is a mistake. 99% of my life has been mistakes, but this was a discovery. Because first of all, we try to check and to repeat and to find all possible artifacts and to understand what is going on. And finally, we realized that when we were looking at the MGO films on molybdenum, the electronic structure was completely different. The gold atom, the sixth S level of gold, was completely full. So you had two electrons in the sixth S level of gold. That means gold was a gold anion, so it was negatively charged. Well, that is a completely different situation from what we have seen on the bare surface. Well, these calculations stimulated Iofreund and Martin Steller to do specific experiments. So we deposit gold and palladium atoms, and this was exactly the truth. So they were confirmed. Now I don't want to go to into details, but the shape of the atoms, this is gold, and this sombrero shape, this uh, ring, indicates the formation of an anion. And also the gold atoms are more distant on the surface because they are negatively charged. 
And this is because you have the metal, you have the oxide, and you have the adsorbate. But if the oxide layer, which is insulating, is thin enough, you may have electron tunneling. And electron tunneling brings electrons from the support to the metal. This was an interesting result. So we said, what happens if we go from an atom to a cluster? And of course, what you see here is a gold 20, which is the exact the real structure of gas phase gold 20. This is two electron volts more stable than a flat iso. Okay. Well, if you put this, these calculations were done in collaboration with Uzi Lamban. If you put the gold 20 on, uh, on top of MGO, the three dimensional remains more stable than the two dimensional shape by 1.2 EV. But if you do the same and you support this on a bilayer of magnesium oxide, you notice the situation is completely reversed. The flat cluster becomes 3D more stable with a three dimensional one. And this is again due to the fact that electrons tunnel to the gold cluster and change completely the electronic structure and the binding. And this was again confirmed by work done by the group of um, by Martin Sterrer and Ayo Freund. They draw NGO films of increasing thickness and they deposit gold clusters. And if, if the films were very thin, the cluster were growing two dimensional. If the oxide were growing thicker and thicker, the gold cluster was growing three dimensional. And finally, after these uh, studies in the mid uh, in, in, in 2010, 2015, our attention moved towards what happens when you have a cluster on a surface and how this changes the properties of the surface, how the reactivity changes at the periphery of, of the cluster, for instance, how uh, these oxygens and uh, a particle react. And this is work which basically connects to work which has been done also here, showing that vacancies, oxygen vacancies are much easier to form when you have a metal particle supported on an oxide. So all this to tell you that in my career, I spent a lot of time working with clusters, supported clusters, nanoclusters, and finally, single atoms. And this is the most recent part of my work. You see that the slightly changed color from blue to white. White is because this is more recent work. However, as you have understand, understood, my, uh, my activity has always been directed to oxides. And for many years, I, said, I, I decided not to work on graphene or carbon-based supports for the simple reason there are so many papers in the literature. I said, what can we discover new? And first of all, if you have to read all this literature, it takes 10 years only to, to get acquainted with what has been done before. But finally, uh, since we had a collaboration with some experimental groups in Korea or Milano, we got involved in graphene-based uh, supports, single atoms on graphene, and so on and so far. And here, of course, coming from the field of supported metal clusters, apparently you enter in a completely new field. Because when you have supported metal clusters on an oxide, you have a, a very um, large number of variables, the cluster size, the cluster shape, the periphery, between the particle and the support, the doping, the defects, and so on and so forth. And when you go to a single atom on graphene or nitrogen dope, graphene or whatever, everything seems very simple. You have one layer of carbon, uh, sp2 carbon. You have one metal atom, which is bound to four nitrogens, for instance. I mean, the, cal the cal uh, cal cal computation gets much easier. The complexity seems to be strongly reduced. And in fact, if you go to the literature, you will find huge numbers of papers on this topic. And you find also people who started to basically try to screen large number of potential catalysts. What does it mean? You compute the properties of hundreds of different systems by changing the transition metal or the, the, the surrounding, and you predict the catalytic activity. Well, wow, it's interesting. Of course, it's, uh, if it works, it's absolutely fascinating. But what I want to report is one particular case which, which shows that things are not as simple as they look. What I'm going to refer to is uh, the same area, semi reaction of water splitting. So, where basically you take protons, you add electrons, and you form hydrogen molecules. 
is a very simple reaction. And since you have that basically the starting point and the, and the end uh, are both with G, uh, with free energy equals zero, if the intermediate, which is an hydrogen atom, which binds to the electron when it captures one electron, is also at uh, free energy equals zero, you have essentially no thermodynamic barrier in your reaction. So this was a model that uh, Nosco proposed some, some years ago, which is called computational hydrogen electron. Essentially, if you have that the binding energy of an hydrogen atom to an electron is close to zero, then uh, that means that the electron doesn't bind hydrogen too strongly or too weakly, and you are on the top of a volcano plot. And is, this is what is called an ideal catalyst. And of course, things become uh, fantastic for theoreticians because what you have to do, you, uh, you take your model catalyst, whatever it is. Yeah, for instance, you have, a, you see a transition metal embedded in four nitrogen atoms in a graphene layer. You put an hydrogen atom, you compute the binding energy of the hydrogen atom, you compute the delta G, which is easy. If it is close to zero, like platinum, very active catalyst. If it is very strongly bound or very strongly unbound, it is inactive, like gold or molybdenum, and poor catalyst. And you see, it's a very simple way of straining very large number of catalysts, which of course has stimulated a huge amount of activity in this field. And so reading the literature, we were also very attracted by the fact that people have introduced descriptors. What is a descriptor? Is a, a combination of simple properties to predict uh, catalyst behavior without doing the calculation. And in particular, this paper attracted our interest because here there was a simple descriptor, phi, which is just a combination of electronegativity of a transition metal surrounding metal atoms and so on. And they proposed a universal descriptor, which is this curve here, where essentially looking at this particular property, as I said, a combination of electronegativity and so on, you can say this catalyst is excellent, close to zero, this catalyst, no, because it's too binding hydrogen too strongly. Or too weak. You see, it's a linear correlation. Fantastic. And since we were newcomers, what we did is what a newcomer should do. We tried to reproduce this data. And this was what came out. In particular, look at nickel. It was one of the systems we studied first. This column, these numbers, are the binding energy of a nitrogen, of a nitrogen atom to a transition metal embedded in this four nitrogen graphene. The paper published in Nature Catalysis was reporting 0.22 PV, excellent catalyst. We computed 1.65, terrible catalyst. Again, the first thing I said to my people said, well, you're doing a very basic mistake. I don't know what, but there is a clearly, clearly mistake. It cannot be. But then they said, no, but this, is, this is the result. We cannot do anything against it. So I, the second thing we decided to do is to look into the literature. And in the literature, we found not one, not two, but four different papers where people have been looking at exactly the same systems. And you see, these numbers were in line with our calculated value for nickel, but also the other uh, uh, values. So what was the problem? Of course, all these studies were using standard PBE, so a standard functional. While the work done by the people of natural catalysis were using PBB plus U, so a correction to include the self-interaction. That, of course, was really shocking for two reasons. If this is true and you change the functional from PBE to PBB plus U, it's not just that you adjust a little bit, little bit the numbers, you change completely the picture. The second thing that is a general comment I found shocking, that these four papers have been published after the initial catalysis paper. But no one of these people tried to figure out why the results differ from the previous ones, which is also quite frightening, you know? Well, having discovered this discrepancy, we try to see what is, if there is a problem when you use different functional. And to make the story short, well, sometimes if you take nickel 
there's no change. This box, this is PV blue, PV plus U red, or an hybrid fraction red. Sometimes cobalt PV gives you a very small binding of delta G for hydro to absorption. PV plus U hybrid functions, they give a much larger. So sometimes you have completely different predictions. Sometimes you have very similar predictions. Well, is, there, is it random? No, it is due to the fact that nickel is closed shell, is a D8, while cobalt keeps some unpaired electrons. And when you have unpaired electrons, you localize them, and then the functional, functional matters. But once we discover this, we went back to the problem, can we reproduce the results of these papers? We, we did exactly the same kind of calculation using this, exactly the same ingredients, and finally, our results and their results were still completely different. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is not just a question of having a small difference in the numbers, because the black spots are the original numbers, the blue spots are our numbers, and you see there is no correlation anymore. And at that point, we got in touch with the authors and with the, with the editors of the journal, and only with the help of the editor of the journal, after three months, we were able to get the original raw data, and we discovered that all the calculations reported in the Nature Catalysis paper were obtained by, by using non-minimum lattice constants. So they were stretching the lattice constants, sometimes by 2%, sometimes by 3%, sometimes in the x direction, sometimes in the y direction. And of course, if you're not in a minimum structure, you can say whatever you want. I always say that even the water molecule, if you compute it linear, is no longer polar. So one has to be careful. <laughs> the paper is now under investigation, and it is almost two years now, and I, am, I want to see the end of the story. But this is not, not all what I, we discover looking at this graphene world, because there is another important message. The Norskov uh, model of a computational hydrogen electrode has been developed for metals. And on metals, uh, on metals, it is well known that you absorb hydrogen on metals, you have only a physical state, and then hydrogen splits into atoms. So on the surface of a metal, you have only hydrogen atoms. And if you want to form an hydrogen molecule, you have only two possibilities. You have an hydrogen absorbate, another proton arrives and captures an electron exactly in the same position, and you form hydrogen that dissolves. Or you have two hydrogen atoms that form and they diffuse until they combine and you release hydrogen. But there is only one intermediate, the hydrogen atom atom. And this is why you can compute only one delta G, which is the delta G of hydrogen on these metal surfaces. However, when you go to single atom catalyst, this looks like very classical organ metallic complexes where you have a, like a porphyry. You have a transition metal in a nitrogen matrix and in a carbon matrix. And of course, this reminded me something that, uh, where I've been working in the 90s, which are the so-called dihydrogen or dihydride complexes. It is well known in organometallic chemistry that you can bind to a transition metal hydrogen elongating slightly the hydrogen-hydrogen bond, so you create a kind of hydrogen complex, like in this chromium complex that they published in 1990, or you can completely break the hydrogen-hydrogen bond, and you end up with a, a dihydride complex. So the two hydrogens are completely dissociated. But here you can bind two hydrogens to the metal center, not only one. And then I said again to my coworkers, is it really possible that nobody has tried in so many years to put two hydrogens on the same metal atom? And in fact, nobody. Hundreds of papers, only one hydrogen. And so I said, okay, let's try to put two hydrogens and see what happens. And what we did, we selected different supports, not only um, graphitic, uh, but also carbon nitride, molybdenum disulfide, more than 50, 60 structures. In most cases, the single transition metal atom can bind two hydrogens. Dihydride, dihydrogen depends very much on the electronic structure, but you bind stably two hydrogens, not only one. 
And of course, this means that you don't have only one intermediate, but you have two intermediates. And if you have two intermediates, the kinetics changes. You don't have only one delta G, but you have two delta Gs. And of course, we worked out the kinetics. And instead of having a vol volcano plot, which is two dimensional, you go to a three dimensional volcano plot. So you have two barriers that you have to overcome. This is the John Di Diberto, my co workers would work it out with equations. So essentially, the final message is that if you work with a single hydrogen atom, you get a picture, which is these are the best cutters cobalt, palladium, platinum embedded in different supports. But if you take into account two steps, because they can stably form, the picture changes and the number of good catalysts shrinks and becomes much smaller. And again, if you don't include all intermediates, and this is the main message, and we have done this also for oxygen revolution reaction and so on, all these systems have many intermediates that do not exist on metal surfaces because they are different objects. If you don't include all the intermediates, all the predictions are purely hypothetical. And the final topic is that people have concentrated a lot on the activity of these materials, activity in catalytic reactions. And they predict this is a perfect catalyst, this is a excellent catalyst, but what about the stability? Because we don't want only to make active, active catalysts, or we all also want to, uh, to be stable. And stable again, because these are electrochemical reactions, for instance, dissolution in water. And so, what we have done recently is, has been to generate, to, to create a general framework to uh, predict and understand the stability. For instance, this is an iron atom in a given support. Support can be covalent organic frameworks, uh, graphene, whatever. And of course, this can be, uh, can evolve into dissolution, the hydrogen, hydrogen atoms go into water, or you form hydroxides, they precipitate, or you form oxide or oxone ions, but again, they go into solution. These are all, all possible redox processes. And so by constructing a thermodynamic cycle where you are basically the binding energy of the iron atom to the support, and then the aggregation of the iron atoms to form the metal, and then the metal that basically dissolves into these different species, we have a cycle where most of the information is experimental, except the binding energy of the transition metal to the support. But this can be computed. And with this information, we can predict the stability in a, wide, in a given range of uh, potential and pH for the solution. So for instance, this is a case of iron atom in for nitrogen graphene. And of course, you see the star means you have the free catalyst without any adsorbent species on it. H star means is a condition where the iron atom is not stable. It becomes stable when it is supported by an hydrogen atom. It's binding an hydrogen or binding an oxygen or going to basically dissolve. And you see there is a wide range of pH and voltage where the catalyst is stable in this case. But if you go to much higher voltage, or pH, you may have the solution. Of course, the support matters a lot because if you take, for instance, an iron atom in carbon nitride, here the situation is completely different. The range of stability, which is this tiny area here where we have a star, is extremely small. The catalyst is very unstable. It dissolves or a form hydroxide in a wide range of pH. So it can be an excellent catalyst, but it will never work. Or you may have extremely stable systems like this iron atom embedded in covalent organic framework. You see that there is, a, again, a wide range of regions where the catalyst is stable. Sometimes when the catalyst is very stable, it's not very active. So these are the two things that you have to go, to go together. And so we have, we have been also been able to identify a descriptor, which is the binding energy of the metal atom to the support, which is this black line, which in a given condition of pH and voltage discriminates between species which are stable and species which are unstable. And you see, for instance, transition metals 
embedded in these covalent organic frameworks, they are always stable. Transition metals embedded in carbon nitride they squares are never stable. And in some cases, you may have supports like nitrogen dope graphene, where the species can be unstable or stable or borderline. And of course, this requires more accurate approaches. And I'm not going to talk about that, but of course, this has to be checked and to improve by using better models of the solvent, better functionals. You can use, you can improve as much as you like. Okay, I'm coming to the end of my talk. So I started here with this point computer power and small clusters in the gas phase, lithium, because it was a light element and simple. Nowadays, we can do many complex uh, uh, simulations, which I think is fantastic. So it opens a number of potential uh, possibilities. However, when it comes to modeling, I think, and this is my final message, there are two possible approaches. If you want to gain insight, if you want to understand, well, every approximate approach, every approximate model is okay, provided that you know which are the kind, the kind of approximations you're doing. So you want to understand. So you want to introduce complexity in an hierarchical way. But if you, if you want to be predictive, and you want to say to our, our experimental colleagues, please do this because it's probably working, you have to be extremely accurate. You have to include all the parameters that are needed. And you have to use the most advanced methods because we must rely on the results quantitatively, not only qualitatively. Okay, and with that, I would like to conclude and thanks, of course, my co workers, in particular, Giovanni Di Liberto, Mario Barlocco, Sergio Tosoni, and Lilo Giordano, and of course, all the experimental colleagues. I didn't talk about the work done, done with them in these years. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.